Yep. All right. Uh, excellent. Welcome, Tyreek, our Yo. next speaker and the lovely creator of our roguelike celebration shirts. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so everyone should get those as yep. well as enjoying your pretty, pretty pleased with how they turned out. I'm very happy. They're colorful and everything. Um, <laughs> so Tyreek, a game developer who's been working on the roguelike platformer Catacomb Kids for 10 or six years, depending on how you count. He's also worked on several games as an artist and animator, including Thor DS, Epic Mickey, Power of Illusion, and Cadence of Hyrule, which is very cool. And has created a couple of roguelikes for a seven day roguelike that he's pretty chuffed with uh, HVNTRS and Athkta in Absurdia. I had to pr practice pronouncing that one, I will admit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it so doesn't, yeah. doesn't really roll off the tongue. No, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little tricky. Uh, take it away. All right. So I am Tyreek. Imminently, I am going to be talking about multiplayer mechanics in traditional roguelikes and my endeavors to create a turn-based roguelike experience with cooperative gameplay in mind. A little background first, uh, which was already covered a little bit, but I'm Tyreek, makeup pixel artist, uh, game game designer, fan of rogue paradigms. And I'm also a fan of the things that I make, which is why I make them. Uh, these are my current rogue credentials, Catacomb Kids, Hunters, Atkatha in Absurdia, and Clean Sweep. Uh, I'm going to be talking about these two, Hunters, which I made for Seven Day Roguelike in 2018, and Clean Sweep, which I've been working on for the past few months, specifically as a sort of proof of concept for this talk. They're both multiplayer roguelikes that employ different methods of handling turn-basedness and player interactivity. In a bit, I'll talk about how I approached each and the things that I learned along the way. But first, before we get to any of my own personal endeavors, let's take a step back and examine the landscape of existing roguelikery that has led me down this path of years-long fascination. So, roguelikes. We know what they are, we celebrate them on occasion, they've been defined and explored multiple times at this very event, and nowadays, there are a great many kinds of roguelikes, with as many settings and styles as one can imagine. But for all of their variety, from the beginning, roguelikes have been primarily focused on the single-player experience, which is kind of a curious thing to me, given the era and inspirations behind many of the staple, uh, staple games of the genre. Uh, Rogue, as with many early fantasy games, took much inspiration from Dungeons and & Dragons and other pen and paper RPGs, trying to capture the feeling of going on an adventure that's different every time, and letting you craft your own hero, but without having the onerous requirement of needing another human to act as judge and mediator between the player and the game's systems. But a large part of those very inspirations, pen and paper RPGs, Tolkien-esque fantasies, etc., have a strong framework or theme of cooperation, camaraderie, friendship, and teamwork. Or alternatively, they provide for stories of intrigue, betrayal, and the pitfalls of human relationships. But they all have the element of humans interacting with each other in ways that reflect their individuality and unique abilities in the context of a group. There are plenty of exceptions, of course, but a lot of times a single individual delving alone into treacherous death traps and achieving godlike power through the acquisition of relics and ancient knowledge is like a supervillain. Uh, heroes generally have friends, and heroes also don't generally lust for godlike power. Uh, this teamwork aspect of the fantasy genres managed to make its way into other computer games that were seeded from the same inspirations, like JRPGs with their four-character adventuring parties that eventually became a convention um, of the entire genre. Um, or first-person dungeon crawls like Wizardry, where you create and control several characters as you plumb the dungeon's depths. Of course, these games aren't multiplayer per se, but they found ways to retain their source inspirations, aspects of teamwork and parties of adventurers. But roguelikes don't seem to have retained the presence of teamwork as a theme in any lasting way, which I think is a shame. The dynamics of a team working together to overcome challenges that no individual could tackle on their own is extremely compelling, both narratively and mechanically. And given the nature of traditional roguelikes and their ability to generate stories through gameplay, I feel like party-based roguelikery is an underexplored space just yearning to be more thoroughly investigated. But I'm not here to just talk about party-based roguelikery. I'm here to talk about multiplayer roguelikery. Not just a fellowship of AI companions or multi-unit control, but a coalition of actual human minds exploring together the procedural spaces and systematic unkindnesses of traditional roguelikes. 
Why is this specifically something worth striving for? Well, I think the first and most obvious reason to explore multiplayer roguelikes is to generate more stories, more fun. Not just tales of yet another stupid death, but yet another stupid party wipe, or yet another ascension post wherein we had to leave behind our companion as they bravely defended a choke point from pursuing forces of evil as we barely escaped. Uh, multiplayer can provide for stories of betrayal as your archer companion steals a vital potion from you to halt their petrification and leaving you at the... At, to your fate at the claws of a basilisk. Uh, stories of revenge as you manage to survive your plight against the basilisk in spite of their betrayal and hunt them down to exact justice. And of course, stories of hilarious tragedy as you both end up cornered and outnumbered when your revenge goes sideways and you both go down in a blaze of irony. Jim Shepard of Dungeon Mans did a talk at Roguelike Celebration in 2019 about simulating relationships in roguelikes, which I thought was very cool and compelling. But maybe you could save yourself a lot of code if you just replaced that simulation with an actual human. Another benefit is that it can help ease people who are new to the genre in if they have a companion to accompany them in their adventures. Imagine if rather than relying on wiki pages and YouTube videos to tell you what the best strategies are or how to navigate an arcane UI, you had someone that could fight alongside you and come to your aid when you managed to get yourself into a tight spot or teach you the mechanics of a game in a much more hands-on, example-oriented fashion. Uh, something that I learned from adding co-op to my game Catacomb Kids is that people are much more tolerant of failure and difficulty if they have someone to fail along with them. And they're much more inclined to keep trying if they have a companion to guide them through early frustrations. Lastly, I think that in addition to the above points, multiplayer and roguelikes has a specific advantage over AI-based allies and parties, which is that it allows for the full gamut of the complexities of the game's systems to be engaged with in a meaningful way by each party member. The complexities allowed for by human engagement go beyond just social interactions. With multiple humans behind multiple characters, you can really dig into the meat of certain systems in ways that would be kind of inconceivable with just AI-based allies or cumbersome and time-consuming to execute with only a single player controlling multiple units. So think of all the buckwild character builds available for, an example, uh, Caves of Cud, a perfectly rational, level-headed game. And now imagine another character as complex, as intelligently built, and as sentiently operated to support and synergize with said Buckwild character. The countless possibilities become even countlesser, more countlessful. So these are the sorts of things that I want and aspire to achieve through exploring multiplayer roguelike spaces. But before I get to my own attempts to achieve these desires, I definitely want to acknowledge that there are precedents for multiplayer in traditional roguelikes. The earliest attempts I'm aware of are Mangband and its child Tomenet, the latter of which is actually what got me thinking about this whole topic in the first place when I stumbled across it years and years ago. Uh, Mangband, as you might infer from the name, is an online multiplayer adaptation of Angband, and Tomenet is a derivation of it. Both games approach the task from a sort of MMO-style angle where players pick a server to join and can interact with anyone else on that server, and uh, both games make concessions to the turn-based nature of their roguelike antecedents, though, by being somewhat real-time. Uh, but to alleviate the burden of doing quick mental acrobatics to assess and react to situations with the shift to real-time, the games let you assign uh, input macros that can execute strings of commands at the press of a button. And indeed, I do believe these macros are probably invaluable at higher levels of the game. The depth and complexity of the games is not diminished at all relative to their contemporaries. Mangband and Tomenet are well and truly old school roguelikes up to and including binding a different function to damn near every key on the keyboard. Both games are still very available and playable and as far as I can tell, at least somewhat active. There's also Dungeon of the Rogue Daemon by Leif Bloomquist, who is gonna be actually talking right after me. This vision of multiplayer roguelikery is almost the polar opposite of Mangband and Tomenets, very stripped down from much of the complexities, very easy to jump into. I won't talk about it much, but because it seems like it might be redundant, seeing as how the next talk is gonna be all about it, but I think it's pretty neat and look forward to hearing about it from the man himself, and I just wanted to bring it up and acknowledge that it exists. So there we have the hopes, the dreams, and the context. Now, at last, we get to me. What have I done? What have I learned in doing so? And for what do I hope? The games I've mentioned so far, Mangband, Tomenut, Dungeon of Rogue Demon, they're all online and allow for, potentially, 
large groups of players to be interacting at once, coming and going as they please. But my desire for multiplayer roguelikery harkens much closer to the idea of a small party of adventurers who trek through thick and thin together, their fates intertwined. Also, I don't know how to code netcode stuff. All of that is to say that my endeavors are first and foremost focused on the local multiplayer experiences of two to four players and a single screen. So with that said, let's talk about Hunters. Hunters, or Hunters, uh, either one works, is a cooperative roguelike for up to four players that I made for the seven day roguelike jam in 2018. The title is an acronym that stands for Hellbeast and Vampire Neutralization and Tactical Removal Squad. The premise of the game is that you and up to three of your friends are members of a squad of vampire hunters tasked with eliminating giant hell beasts after the world has been taken over by forces of evil in a medieval-ish demon apocalypse. My initial goal with the game was to simulate a sort of monster hunting party traveling through the lair of a huge dangerous beast and fighting it through cleverness rather than direct confrontation. That isn't exactly what I ended up making, but I'm extremely pleased with how it turned out regardless. And of all the game jams I've ever done, this is probably the one that I'm most eager to revisit someday and turn into a full-fledged game. So how does it work? Well, it was important for me that three things be true for the game going in. One, you should be able to take your time on deciding on a course of action as with traditional roguelikes. I most specifically didn't want there to be any turn timers or real time elements that put any pressure on players beyond just making the best choice they can. And two, turns shouldn't make other players wait for ages. This might seem kind of contradictory to one, but what it essentially means is that I wanted to limit the decision space enough to the point that determining your possible courses of action could be done quickly, and once an action is decided upon, it should be easy to input and execute. And lastly, multiplayer should matter. I didn't want this to be a game where you could just be a single player who happens to have other single players around. I wanted to encourage teamwork and collaborative strategizing and risk-taking on behalf of others. So how did I attain these goals? Through queued actions, streamlined gameplay, and several overlapping layers of player interactivity that make it hard to ignore one another. So to handle turns, I wanted something that wouldn't be obtrusive, but would still allow for the space to think things through when necessary. And what I came up with is having each player input their action to queue it up for execution. And as soon as every player has decided on their action, the turn resolves. It's pretty straightforward. It's very easy to understand, and because of that, it's very easy to coordinate your actions with others. And the fact that it's easy to coordinate with others is actually a really important part of what makes it so work so well for keeping turns short. Allowing players an easy means to coordinate with each other helps keep everyone engaged even when they've already decided on their own course of action. And for particularly complicated situations, having multiple brains mull over the best way forward really helps narrow down one's options and speed things along. Of course, this way of handling turns isn't without its drawbacks. For one thing, turn order does still matter and can be diff and it can be difficult to suss out the result of certain actions like two players trying to move into the same tile at the same time, or does a player move before or after being shield bashed and shoved by another player? It helps to have clear and consistent rules to have for how these sorts of interactions are resolved or otherwise a means of checking which players have action priority over others. And that is to say, who is going to act first in any situation. Also, while basically unnoticeable in combat, having even a brief wait to uh, for all the queued inputs to register can get irritating in lower stakes situations like backtracking through an empty dungeon. And lastly, queued actions like this are reliant on the rest of the game being designed in a streamlined enough way to maintain the flow of the game for everyone. You don't want to get bogged down, for example, by, for, by one player needing to allocate skills while everyone sits around or having to navigate several layers of menus in order to equip a weapon. Which brings me to my next point. Having hunters be streamlined and straightforward was important for me for a number of reasons, both to support the aforementioned turn queue system in a way that would keep it from getting burdensome and to make the game easy to grasp and welcoming to new players, which is, I think, pretty important for a multiplayer game. To this end, the combat is deterministic with no dice rolls or chance involved. Uh, the, the enemies have simple AIs that behave in consistent, predictable ways. Inventory is kept to just three items, and inventory management is just a matter of pressing the button you want to assign an item to. 
uh, and no action in the game is further than two button presses away at any given time. You never have to navigate a menu or even really read anything at all. Uh, and all you ever need to know in order to assess a situation is to just look at the screen and see what's happening. There's no hidden information anywhere. Lastly, there are the mechanics by which I hope to encourage teamwork and collaboration, like being able to hurt each other, which at first might seem like the sort of thing that would discourage teamwork, but my goal with including it was to encourage players to communicate with each other so they don't end up accidentally offing one another. Uh, several of the melee weapons in the game strike multiple tiles, like the axe and the spear, and if you're standing in the wrong place or not telegraphing your intentions properly, it can be easy to find yourself on the receiving end of a blow in addition to the intended target. I will definitely concede, though, that friendly fire might actually just suck in practice, especially in a game that's already pretty dang tough in a genre that's known for being tough. It might be a little bit overkill. But it's in the game, and my intentions were noble, so let's just say a lesson was learned. More actually helpful, more, sorry, uh, more actually helpful to the end of encouraging teamwork are probably items that we get set up and pay off. These are the items that enable players to think ahead and act in ways that as a solo adventure would probably be of limited use, but as a member of a team become invaluable tools. Things that let you manipulate the positions of enemies and allies and uh, actions that you normally wouldn't want to take, but become really, really interesting and unique when used in the context of team play. Uh, there's a lot of fun possibilities here, and I feel like Hunters barely scratches the surface, uh, but I feel like it's a space that's really worth exploring. Uh, Hunters also features a sort of bleed-out timer that lets you revive your allies if you get to them quick enough. Uh, saving them requires you spend several turns in a row standing next to them, though, which can result in some tense moments as you try to hold your ground next to them for long enough to bring them back. So that's Hunters, streamlined, four-player, co-op, roguelike. Like I said, I'm very pleased with how it turned out, and I'm eager to revisit it and make it something great. Um, but before we get ahead of ourselves, there is another more recent endeavor that I've been chewing on that's a bit more unconventional. For me, at least, it was just as educational. Clean Sweep is an experiment I've been working on since late June based on a thought I had years ago about how to handle multiplayer in roguelikes. In it, you play as an elite squad of cleaning agents who are tasked with eliminating all the nasties on each floor and reducing the grime to an acceptable level. My goals for Clean Sweep were much the same as they were for Hervinters, uh, which is to say no time-limited turns or real-time actions, but also it shouldn't make other players wait forever but also the multiplayer needs to matter. But also, also, I had the additional goal of trying to ease back in some of the complexities found in larger scope roguelikes, or at least to allow for, to allow for the possibility of them. Uh, this time, I didn't want to shy away from the idea of having a larger inventory or more involved interactions and situations that require a bit more scrutiny. So I dug up this thought I had from years ago. What if creatures only cared about the turns of the player most relevant to them? There's a cat. I'm sorry if you can hear that. And that's how I came up with the parallel asynchronous schedule. I'm going to call it that because it sounds fancy and I'm allowed to make fancy turns up and you can't stop me. Uh, but the basic premise is that for the most part, creatures don't need to care about whose turn it is on a global scale. Global, global scale. scale sorry, uh, just whose turn it is on the most relevant scale. And the most relevant turn is usually that of the nearest or most threatening player. So creatures can get, get away with not moving when just any player moves, but only advancing their turn when the player most relevant to them moves. The end result of this is a system wherein creatures only act when the player most relevant to them acts. Of course, the interesting and challenging aspect of this is determining what it means for a player to be most relevant. But if you can manage to suss out the intricacies of that, the result should be a system wherein enemies each align themselves to a specific player's turn schedule, and each player can take their turn essentially whenever they want to with no time pressure and without slowing down the game for other players. So that's the idea. Parallel, because creatures are operating on essentially separate turn schedules while still existing in the same space. 
asynchronous because players don't have to move in any kind of unity and can take as much or as little time as they want with a situation and schedule because that's the word for organizing units of time. So that's what I did in Clean Sweep. And it worked pretty great. You can see in this clip that there are two ats, two cleaning agents, wandering around, facing off against different groups of enemies, managing their inventory, all without infringing upon the other's ability to act or causing a turn to in advance at the inopportune time or having to wait for anything or having to rush anything, which is exactly what the goal was. Each enemy, after spotting a player, sinks itself so that it only moves in time with that player's actions. It works really well for when the players are far from one another or separated by walls, but that's not really a huge surprise. The question is what happens when players aren't so far apart? Well, the matter of which player is most relevant in that case becomes a lot fuzzier, but we can establish clear guidelines to decide. First, and most obviously, is who can I see? If you break line of sight for long enough, the creature will stop targeting you and free itself up to... Oh. Sorry. Oh, wow. Sorry. <laughs> I just got the comment. Um... Oops. Anyway, sorry. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Here we go. Um, line of sight. If you break line of sight for long enough, the creature will stop targeting you and free itself up to wander and target someone else. And whenever a creature isn't actively targeting someone, it becomes unsynced and moves when any player acts. Uh, proximity. Who's closest to me? If a player uh, steps into a space immediately adjacent to a creature, they instantly become its target. And otherwise, the closer a player is, the more likely it is to draw the monster's attention away from whoever it's currently targeting. Threat. A player that attacks a monster instantly becomes its target. And lastly, activity. Um, which player that I can see and is within a certain range has taken a number of actions greater than that of my current target? That's a really complicated way to say, if one player is sitting still for ages while the other, while another is nearby moving around and using items and doing stuff, uh, go after the player that's actually doing stuff. And that's about it for the rules that determine which player the AI chooses to target. There are a couple minor exceptions and details here and there just to tweak the feel of things, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. And here's an example of those rules in play. You can see that the enemies target first the player that comes within their visual range and then the most active player. And if either player steps right next to a monster, uh, that monster turns their attention and attacks them. So does the idea that you can essentially take some free actions near certain enemies as long as they're targeting someone else or force enemies to change targets as long as you know the rules for how they focus their attention seem exploitable? Probably it is, but it really depends on the kind of game you're making. And if you're using the system, then it follows that you'd be designing your game around the possibility of such exploits. And maybe instead of calling them exploits, you could call them tactics. Uh, I don't know if you'd be able to just drop this system into an already established roguelike though and expect great results, so I wouldn't mind seeing someone try it. But the promise to me is more in the potential and in this and for further exploration down the road. So that's parallel asynchronous schedule, but that's not, not all that's going on in Clean Sweep. Like I said, I've been working on it for the past few months and it's been become kind of a dumping ground for all of my experimental roguelike ideas. For instance, in addition to the parallel schedule, you can modify any action so that instead of happening instantly, it is queued up to be executed simultaneously with the next player who takes an action. So I basically stuffed Hunter's system into this one. This lets you do cool stuff like get an attack bonus if you and another player strike each other, strike a, an enemy at the same time, or get a speed boost if another player pushes you in the same direction that you're already moving. Or if you queue up an action and stand still, you'll catch any, any item that another player throws at you, which is a much more fun and time efficient way of swapping items than dropping them on the ground for someone else to grab or having to sidle up to each other and trade things via a menu. Uh, there was actually a very cool moment when I was playing with a friend where I was surrounded by enemies and very near to death and he tossed me a healing item and I used it and made a glorious comeback 
And it was just like, hooray, teamwork. It was such a small thing, but it felt good to experience the kind of scenario that I designed this game with the hope of seeing. There's also like Splatoon inspired territory control where you have to like clean up the level as you go and monsters can dirty it up again. And you're graded at the end of each floor based on how clean you made it. There's a bunch of stuff going on. So far, I've been talking about multiplayer in the context of cooperation and friendly party-based dungeon delving, but there also exists the potential in roguelikes for less friendly multiplayer interactions. And strap in because this isn't going where you think it's going. So I mentioned that Clean Sweep has been kind of a dumping ground for all of my roguelike ideas, and that includes an idea that I had originally hoped to be the foundation of my seven-day roguelike entry this year, uh, but very quickly abandoned. Uh, it never really got out of my head, though, so when I got to making Clean Sweep, I figured, why don't I just try and stuff it in here? And that idea was Twitch chat interactions, which is still technically a form of multiplayer. Uh, I first got this idea from Joshua Skelton of Delver Renown, who uh, quite a while ago streamed work on a Twitch chat-controlled roguelike-ish arena where players could join and input commands like north, 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 east, north, north to control little characters by queuing up a string of directional movements that then executed over several turns. Well, I love that idea, and I was like, I'm just going to steal that. The initial thought was, hey, if I'm working on multiplayer stuff, I wonder if there's a way to expand that to include people beyond just the small party of characters, but without necessarily betraying the idea of the small party being main focus. And then it was, hey, there's a whole website full of crowdsourceable antagonists who have proven willing and able to engage in games with surprisingly complex and skillful ways uh, with extremely limited input methods called Twitch. Uh, so now you can join Clean Sweep from Twitch chat and possess a monster and give it commands like go to Large West Cavern or Chase Player 2. And I'm not going to actually go into a whole lot of depth on the specifics of the Twitch integration because I think that it's actually the least fun part and probably the biggest failure of the game. But I did want to bring it up because I learned a few things from it and I feel like there's still some promise there if somebody else wants to explore it in the future. Uh, the main things I have to say about the Switch experiment are these. Firstly, visuals are way more important when you have random people popping into chat with no idea what they're looking at and are not well versed in the visual language of traditional roguelikes. Even more so than was my goal with Hunters, having people be able to quickly and easily parse a scenario through visual information alone becomes extremely important. Secondly, being able to give the chat and player different views of the game would probably be most ideal. It's hard for chat-controlled characters to do smart things to surprise the player if they either can't see themselves or are always in view of the player. I wish I could have given the chat players a more holistic view of the game so that they could use their human brains to the fullest and set up scenarios unbeknownst to the player. Uh, and lastly, the minimum viable fun might not be very minimum, minimal. Uh, Chat-controlled creatures need to be able to do interesting and useful things and more interesting and useful things than just, just chasing and hurting the player. Um, but to my mind, that means having a lot of systems in place for them to play with from the get-go. The promise of this idea is that monsters can have actual minds behind them, but what good is an actual mind behind a monster if the only actions available to them are make the player's HP go down? I feel like for this to be an interesting and worthwhile thing to pursue, there needs to be more at stake than just the player's end and a number of ways to make that happen. So there you have it. That's the things I have to say about multiplayer roguelikes. I don't know if there will ever be a standard system for handling multiplayer in roguelikes or if there will ever be enough multiplayer roguelikes to warrant a standard system. But I do hope that this talk has at least encouraged others to prod at the edges of our assumptions and see what sorts of ridiculous new stories we can make with roguelikes and friends together. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, thank you so much, Tyreek. That, yeah, people are, are very excited. Lots of ideas. Uh, I think someone mentioned that their brain was throbbing. Which oh boy. I, <laughs> I don't know if I, I think you should see a doctor. That doesn't sound healthy. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we have a ton of questions, but only one minute. So probably can't actually dig into them. So I think that probably the only question inside of here we actually have time to answer is what is your cat's name? My cat's name? Well, the one that was meowing 
is actually named Jesus, but my cat's name is Pixel. Okay, multiple cats. And there's also there's also a Scotty running around somewhere. Gosh, you can't show us. Can you show us any of the cats? Uh, I don't. I don't see any. <laughs> yeah. I don't see any within within thirty seconds of reach of me right now. So so sad. So sad. Everyone loves the cats, though. Uh, yes. Standard of all online communication. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna take a screenshot of all of these great questions, and hopefully people can try and find you in a room later. Maybe let people sure. hang out at the bar or something like that. Um, because yeah, excellent. Tons of questions. Wish we had more time, but it was just so packed full of information. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.